Good morning, everyone. So we are going to get started with a new module today. But before we jump into that, I'd like to uh, to check out a little how was module four. Was it like, uh, did anybody feel that module four was actually easier than the stuff that we covered in module one, two, or three? No? Okay. So I'm assuming everybody felt that it was a little bit harder. What kind of complexity? What was the difference there? What did you find more complicated in other terms? Say that again. That was the same. Okay, cool. All right, your mileage might vary. Okay, the difference of complexity that you are experiencing between the first part of the course and module four is the same kind that you are going to experience most likely when you go from COP 2512 to 2513. Okay, 2512 is still mostly focused on how to program. That was module one, two, three, that was the core of it, right? 2513 is focused on techniques that are available in the programming language. So the kind of stuff, the kind of little details that we uh, that we took a look at with module four, this is exactly the kind of stuff that we work on along with some important concepts, but we still have a very technically oriented point of view in COP 2513, okay? So I just want you to have a heads up on that kind of stuff. Uh, those of you who already knew programming when you came, could you please raise your hand? Okay. How many of you learned something new in module four? Some stuff. Okay. All right. Cool. Good news. All right. So let's move on to, to the next modules. So the next module, singular. So we are talking about module five now. So we are following the, the textbook, okay? So the textbook is meant to be pretty much a first time programmer introduction. So it starts with the data types and it tells you everything about the data type. That was module four. And then it talks about conditional statement. So the if else statement that we have already learned how to use and it's going to drill down and try to warn you about everything that can go wrong with if else statement as well as show you different ways to write them, okay? So it's the same ID here. So you know already how to use the if else statement. You have been applying that during module one to three. So part of it is going to be review again. Part of it is going to be building on what you already know. So module five, conditional statement and Boolean expression. So it may not be a big relief for you, but it's a big relief for me, is I try to, to actually stick to a very simple Boolean expression during the first part of the course. You know, it's always a comparison, an expression compared to another expression, like x lesser than five, right? And that, that was our entire universe for Boolean expression. Well, now we're going to finally introduce Boolean operators. So a little bit of Boolean algebra, and we're going to be able to write things a lot more concisely, okay? Those of you who went through the practice exercise, who found themselves writing something like, if x is greater than 10, and then inside of that, if x is lesser than 20, just to check if x is between 10 and 20, we're going to do that with a single if statement now. So as usual, there's a reading assignment. It's not optional. The PQ is there to help you make sure you don't miss anything important. And the GQ is going to measure your understanding of the reading and lecture combined. These are the learning objectives for the module. Same convention as usual. In green, what we already covered in module one, two, and three. In red, what I'm going to really make a big fuss about during the lecture, and in black, what is actually more side detail, stuff like that, that you're going to find in the reading assignment. This is going to be a glorious module. We have almost every learning activity in this module. Okay, it's not going to be a big module. Uh, generally speaking, the module on data manipulation, the previous one, is perceived by students as a little harder than this one. So it's not going to be a long module. It's not going to be as difficult if you experience difficulty with the previous one, uh, but we're still going to go through all of those 
activities. So PQ, PEs, PEs are going to be released immediately. Next slide. Uh, PQ is already up and running. GQ, the due date is done, is already set. I mean, uh, G as well, and there's going to be an IE. Um, is there going to be an IE? Yeah, it should be an IE. So I'm going to double check, but there should be an IE5 coming up at the end of this module. Let me double check on that because that might be a remnant from last semester. Uh, practice exercise, you know the drill. These are like from the textbook, come for help. Uh, graded exercise on coding bat. We have uh, five of them this time. Uh, so again, you can come for help. They are graded, but you can come for help. I prefer that you come for help to us than you know, just try to get help elsewhere. Um, and that's it. That's for the logistic of this module. So let's jump right in. So to look at conditional statements, since we have been playing with them already, I'm going to kind of like take a live coding approach to that. So let me make sure that my JGrasp is up and running. Here we are. And we are going to take a look together at this stuff once again. All right, this is a slide. This is not what I want. This is not what I want. There you go. All right. So the syntax, we've been drilling that already for like a bunch of weeks, okay? So the syntax of the if else statement, easy stuff. There we go. If condition open, close, else open, close. And little command and if, okay? Um, when I work with some of you during office hours, some of you are still not writing the stuff like that, okay? So we are reaching the point of no return. Meaning that if you if you don't write stuff like that, like the entire if else statement and then fill the blanks, but you are still getting okay in the course, you know, your, your code is compiling and everything, then don't listen to me. Go and do your stuff, you're fine. Okay. If you don't write the stuff like that, like I told you since the beginning of the semester, and you still find yourself hunting down, oh, I don't know what this else is corresponds to. The compiler tells me I have one too many else, I have one too few else, I have one too many curly brace, blah, blah, blah. Stop. That is the point of no return. If you continue messing around and not following my advice, you will progressively lose more and more footing in this course. So if you cannot write you know, a statement that is correct, syntactically correct, here's a trick to do it. And that will work every single time. If you don't know how to write it yet, you're not comfortable and you don't follow the advice, then there's nothing I can do at this point. Okay? But it's going to accelerate real quick between now and the end of the course, so watch out for this. So we have our if else syntax, okay? And uh, we discussed a few things about that, uh, that syntax. So let me get like a very simple example here, int x equal zero, int y equal 42, if x lesser than y, then we're going to do a system dot out dot printed n. Uh, okay, option number one. And if that is false, we're going to do a system dot out print a land option number two. All right. So that's the basic syntax of uh, the if statement. There are a few things that I told you about that syntax. Okay, if you remember, uh, the few things that I told you about the syntax where well there was a little bit of uh, a fuss about you know where you put your curly braces, and I told you well th this is something that's not really important. Okay, there are different ways of writing the curly brace, and we're not going to get into that. Well, uh, maybe I lied, I guess, because we're going to get a little bit into that. So the, the two possibilities were to write the curly brace, starting opening a curly brace at the end of the line, and the other possibility was to write it like this, you know, and some people prefer this. There we go, this is, uh, for some people, this is clearer, okay, because the closing curly brace aligns really well with the opening curly brace, but whatever, okay? And I told you I don't care and neither should you for the most part, okay? There's only one little thing, one little um, exception situation where you might actually care about this stuff. What happens if, I guess I should have compiled this to make sure I'm not showing you the crappy code, okay? There we go. So what happens right now if I run it? If I run it, I'm getting option number one, okay? Uh, let me remove this comment, it's going to get in the way. What if I put a semicolon here? 
That was it compile. Yeah, it compiles. Does it run? Yeah, it runs the same. So pretty much what I can learn from that is, you know what? I never had to put a semicolon after a closing curly brace. But apparently, if I put a semicolon there, Java doesn't care. OK? All right, OK. What if I put a semicolon here? Control B. Else, without an if statement. What's going on here? Yeah? Yes, that semicolon, if it's closing off, it's actually even more sneaky than that, okay? But th that's the idea. The semicolon is indeed closing off the E statement here. And when I reach else, it's like, you know, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't have an E statement, you know, to attach it uh, because your E statement was closed. What's interesting is that if I remove this, okay, and I do uh, this like that, try to compile it. Now there's no problem. There's no else that cannot be attached to a if statement. OK. But what's going to happen if I run it? It's going to display number one. Well, yeah, that's what it did until now. OK, so let me change the values here. What if I say x is actually 42 and y is 0? Build it. It's still compiling. Run it. Oh, what well, do you know? Still number one. So what's happening here? And it's the derivative of what you already mentioned. Go ahead. Um, uh, it's not actually an if statement. It's kind of, it just skips it, and then it's just an if statement. OK, and this is where I can jump in and add just one little thing to what both of you already spotted, which is technically this is an if statement. It's, it's been terminated, yeah? But this if statement is even a complete if statement, meaning that it's an if statement that has actually a block of code to execute when the condition is true. And uh, so this is what we have called a half if statement because I don't have else, right? Where is that block of code? Well, the first reflex is to say, well, this is my block of code for the if statement. OK? No, it's not. Let me put a line here. Do you see it now? If x lesser than y, execute this. The semicolon is there to end a statement, right? If I just put a semicolon, remember like our second lecture, building block zero, if I just put a semicolon, is that okay? Yes, it's okay. That just means no statement and a statement. So this is actually an empty statement. So if the condition is true, execute that empty statement. And then that's it. So I could even have here else and move on like that, attach that block here, I could try at least, right? So control B, build, yeah, it's working. So now if I run this, it's going to display number one because this condition is false. So I skip the block that correspond to what I need to execute when the condition is true. And I find an else connected to that if, and I execute this block instead. So what's going on here? What if I remove those curly braces again here? So now I'm getting some really weird notation, okay? But bear with me. Still working. So what is the rule out of that? The thing is, when you and I started writing code, I ask you as a temporary favor, right? That every time you write an if statement, you write if parentheses, open curly brace, close curly brace, else open curly brace, close curly brace, and then fill in the blank, okay? It's because that way you cannot make mistakes. But Java is more flexible than that. So Java is letting you actually, if you want, it's letting you get rid of the curly braces. But there's a little rule. There's a little caveat here attached to that, OK? If I don't have a block of code with curly braces like that after the, the condition or after the else, OK? Java is going to look for one statement and only one statement. That means that no curly braces here, doesn't matter. There was only one statement, an empty statement. No curly braces around system.outprintln1, doesn't matter. That's the only thing I wanted to execute in the else block. OK? So we can, we can actually alleviate a little bit the curly brace else situation now 
we can write if else statement that are a little bit easier to read, um, a little bit more parsimonious. Okay, you don't have to put as many as much junk as much verbosity as you know in them. Um, but this is not this is not a panacea. There are still caveats attached to that as well. Uh, it can go wrong. So let's talk a little bit about how and when that kind of stuff can go wrong. So I'm going to grab a code example that I have somewhere here. Uh, what is it? There we go. So I'm cutting and pasting that from the slide so you'll have it. I'll also upload the code that we are uh, playing with right now. I'm going to paste that directly. Well, let's put it here instead of this. And by the way, just to illustrate what I was telling yesterday, or not yesterday, uh, Monday, about when you have to paste from slides or a web page or something like that, you can do paste special and then say reach text format, and that will eliminate any chance that there is a bad trust set um, characters that is pasted. I'm sorry. Oh, no, that's funny. Well, that was a cut and paste from hell. Um, hold on. It's apparently the HDMI port is having an issue. Okay, there we go. We're back. We'll see how long that lasts. Um, okay, so what I was saying is we're going to take a look at a piece of code here. And that piece of code is going to introduce a very interesting little bug. So let me reindent that thing because the cut and paste completely messed it up. There we go. There we go. Let's try to compile this. So the code is checking if x modulo 2 equals 0. So if x is actually a multiple of 2, meaning if x is even. Okay, And then, so I'm using that, that trick I just learned that I can get rid of curly braces. Okay, Then I look inside the code that I execute if this is true, and I say if x is greater than 10, then, so I know that both those conditions are true, I can say x is even and is greater than 10. And then I have an else connected here to the first if statement, and it displays system to unprint land x is not even. So if it's not even, I don't check anything more. So let's use, well, let's use this example here, x is 42. So let's compile, let's run, and it tells, it tells me x is even and is greater than 10. Awesome. So now I'm going to try not 42, I'm going to try 43. And I'm expecting, you know, x is not even, so compile. All right, I don't get anything. That's a problem, all right? And then if I do something like 4, x is not even. So what's going on here? It's a derivative of the rule that we just installed in the previous slide, OK? I'm not using curly brace. That's fine. I can do that in Java. I'm writing my code like if I was programming in Python. What I mean by that is I'm being very careful to indent properly my code so that it's obvious that this is what I execute when this is true. This is what I execute when the first condition is false, OK? And the only problem with that is that indentation doesn't matter for Java. It matters for Python. This is how Python tells you know what the block of code are. Java uses curly braces, period. That's it. So here, what's happening is that this first if statement has no curly brace to delineate the block of code to execute. So if the condition is true, one statement will be executed. And if I ask JGrasp to auto-indent my code, you are going to see what it sees as being one statement. The one statement right after the closing parenthesis here is an if statement. An if statement is a composite statement. It has blocks of code inside of it. So this whole thing here is my if statement. So if this is true, execute this. Else, well, there's no else. And that's kind of like what some of you have been dealing with already when you didn't put all the curly braces or you didn't put too many of them or something like that. You had else that were not connected to the if that you wanted it to connect to. Well, in doubt, use that button here and then that one. And you're going to see exactly how JGrasp understand your code by the way it indents it. Okay, but that works only if it compiles. So if it doesn't compile, then you have to first make it compile and then auto-indent like this. Okay. So 
It's kind of a funny situation, but that's actually a very common mistake, especially in the first programming class. Okay, so watch out for that. Uh, now that you look at the code, you can tell that all of this execute only if x is even. So when I say x is even and greater than 10, yes, that's an appropriate statement to put here. But when I say x is not even, that's wrong. So how do I fix it? The first version I showed you was how a bad programmer writes it. The second version that you see here, the properly indented, is how Java understood it. But now I want to go back to what I originally was trying to say, which is this should only be executed if this condition is true. To do that, go back to the curly braces. Curly brace here, curly brace there, realign. Okay, and I don't have to put necessarily a curly brace here, right? But I put the minimal amount of curly brace to allow me to convey exactly what I wanted to convey to Java. Okay, so I ran it with four. Well, four is even, four is not greater than 10. There's no else here for that if, so I don't display anything and I'm done. Okay, and if I go real quick through my test, to do some regression testing there. If I do 42 here, it's going to be even and greater than 10. And if I do 43 here, it's going to be not even, okay? So that's it, that's a full story. That's a story that I tried to kind of sweep under the rug at the beginning. That's a full story about if else statement syntax in Java, not only in Java, in C that you're going to deal with in 3515, uh, in C++, C sharp, I mean, I've most modern language that use curly brace are going to do that to you, okay? Uh, the exception being the family of language like Python, and there's another one, but I always forget the name, but uh, Python uses indentation. So Python forces you to indent your code correctly and does away with the possibility of mixing and messing up curly braces. The bottom line of that, I try to always get the, you know, the, the redux pretty much out of it is if you write things like I told you to write them at the beginning of the semester. So I'm going like crazy with curly braces, all right? Here's a curly brace. I'm going to put an empty else block here. And there's an uh, else block here. I'm putting curly braces. Well, yes, it's a lot of curly braces. It's a pain in the rear, okay? However, it's guaranteed that like that, you're not going to mess up. That's why we started like this, okay? So consider that your training wheels. When you write code in an exam, if you are still shaky about this kind of stuff, if you still waste you know, 10 minutes trying to balance out your else and statements with the if they correspond to, and your open curly brace with a closing one, then put the training wheel on, okay? Use that way of writing code. As soon as you can, start moving away from that. That will make your life a lot easier, okay? All right. Let me check real quick if this is all we have to do to say on this. Yep, this is. So we can move on to the next section here. Maybe we can, hold on. Sorry. Let's scroll through that. There we go. Next section here, comparison operator, logical operator. So same thing. We have already 50% of that already known because we have our, our comparison operator, sorry, the logical operators are the one that we are going to add to the lot. So first quick remark, but I think you already got that by now. When I talked about expressions, okay, an expression was pretty much some code that's going to be evaluated into a value, okay? And we talked about numerical expression, arithmetic expression, pretty much. We talked about Boolean expression a tiny bit, and we didn't have much to say because we didn't cover a lot of the Boolean algebra syntax in Java, right? So all I said is, you know, x lesser than five, that's an expression too. And that's an expression that's a Boolean expression, so it returns true or false. So everything that you can do with a numerical expression, pass it to a method, okay? Evaluate it and return the value from a method, assign it to a value. You can do all of that stuff also with Boolean expression. Here's an example where I have a simple Boolean expression. I compute x modulo 2, and then I compare that to 0. We've been using that like on and off in, in the last few modules, right? Well, this is going to be true or false. So I can assign it to a variable of type Boolean. 
So I can have arithmetic expression, I can have Boolean expression. Very soon we're going to deal with string expression, expression that involves the manipulation of text and stuff like that. When you have your Boolean variable, you can use your Boolean variable in the condition of a if else or condition of a while statement, okay? It represents a Boolean value. So everywhere you will expect a Boolean value, you can just test if is even. If that is true, if is even contains true, that very simple expression here is going to evaluate to true. If it contains false, it evaluates to false. So pretty much you have been using is even to make a decision between displaying this or displaying that, okay? Just a few remarks here, just so that you understand that there are the same rules applying pretty much for uh, expression of any type, where you can use them, et cetera. And it all boils down to what kind of value they return, what is a data type as the value they return, okay? So, all of this is covered. That's what we had to play with until now. What we had to play with until now where comparison operator, I told you there are six of them. They generally are no problem for students. You just have an expression, a comparison operator, another expression, and the whole thing represents a Boolean expression. Where we fell short is for stuff like this. What if you want to test if X is between 23 and 42 not inclusive? So that would be the way we write it in math. That would be also the way that you write it in other programming language, such as Python. There are some programming language that allow you to chain comparison in an expression. So this is a Boolean expression, and I have one comparison here and then a follow-up comparison here. Java and many of the languages that use a curly brace, a family of syntax, do not allow you to do that. So until now, the only, the only way we had to cope with it is to break down this kind of logical you know, comparison of x with 23 and 42 into two if statement. So the first one was if 23 is lesser than x. So if that is true, then I check again if x is lesser than 42. And if that is true as well, then I can, for example, set a Boolean variable to true. That Boolean variable is going to represent whether this condition as a whole is met. But I need two if statement to solve it. So to implement it. So what we want is this. And this is used in every language, in programming language. Nobody is going to write code like that. So we did until now, until module three, simply because that you're going to see what kind of headache it can spare you. But now is the time for us to, to write the code as it should be written. And so we need to be able to compose Boolean expression like this. What did I add in the middle? It's called the Boolean operator. So it's not a comparison operator. This one is a logical Boolean operator. An operator here, this one is binary, so it takes two operands. I have a Boolean expression here, so it needs to tell me true or false. I have another Boolean expression on the other side, and so it's going to return true or false. And then I apply the logical AND operator. And the logical AND operator looks, works exactly like the AND that we use in every day. Okay, there is wind and it rains. That means the proposition there is wind is true and the proposition it rains is true. When both of them are true, then the whole proposition it rains and there is wind is going to be true, okay? So this is exactly what we're going to use. So we have a few of those logical operators that we're going to uh, introduce. These are common in all programming language. Uh, they are just written sometimes differently. Like some language are going to actually write and a and D. Some languages like C, C sharp, I think C++ definitely, and Java, they are going to write a logical AND with two ampersand symbols, one after the other, no space. That's just a notation. So different family of language are going to use different syntax. For us in Java, the logical AND, also called the logical conjunction, is going to be noted like this. The logical or logical disjunction is going to be noted with two vertical bars, so two pipe symbols, one after the other, pipe characters. The negation, so these are like binary operators, right? They take two operands. The negation, which is a unary operator, you negate something. So if that something is true, it becomes false. If it was false, it becomes true. That's going to be noted as an exclamation mark. We already encountered that. And that's the reason, by the way, 
why when you try to write if x is different than zero, for example, in Java, you write exclamation mark equal. It's meant to be consistent with the fact that an exclamation mark by itself is just a logical negation, okay? And then the last one that we don't use that often is called the exclusive, exclusive or, or logical exclusion. This is a hat symbol. Um, and that one is a particular, it's a different, slightly different type of logical or operator. We're going to see exactly what the difference are. So, well, that's going to come right here. So to illustrate the difference between this guy and this guy, we're going to use a very French gastronomical dilemma, okay? At the end, you go to a restaurant in France, you're going to have maybe a mention on the menu that says, you can have cheese or dessert included for the price. And then the question is, can I have both or not? So this is really important question, at least back in France, I guess. But uh, this is a difference also between the logical disjunction, this one, and the logical exclusion. And this is another example that shows that when we, we speak using a natural language, whatever it is, we tend to be very ambiguous. There's a lot of room for misunderstanding. Like, for example, if I tell you, you can take cheese or dessert, for some of you, it's going to be clear, I can take both. For some of you, it's going to be clear, I only take one. But the bottom line is that it's still not accurate enough for everybody to be 100% clear. So the common agreed way of interpreting those statement is the everyday life or is a logical disjunction. That means that you can have one, you can have the other, or you can have both. But what do we do when we mean actually or in the sense of you have to make a choice. It's going to be that one or that one, but not both. In Java, we use the symbol. It's abbreviated X or, exclusive or. And the name kind of says it all. That means that it's a logical disjunction, but it's exclusive. Once you choose one, you cannot have the other, right? So if you see a... a menu in a restaurant somewhere that says you can have cheese x or dessert included that's probably somebody who has a degree in computer science okay but other than that we don't use that in everyday islands but we are going to use that when it when we program because it matters so to tell you the meaning of those operators a little bit more formally i'm going to introduce truth tables how many of you already saw truth tables a few of you Okay, almost everyone. Okay, so we're going to go fast over that stuff. All right, so the truth table is just a list of everything that can happen and what is the result produced by the operator, right? So the negation, if I have a proposition P, it can be it's Boolean, it can be true or false. So negation of P, well, when P is true, it's going to be false. When P is false, it's going to be true. That's it, that's how you define the negation operator. So here, we are just have like a little example with two variables, age and weight. So if you if you know already what the truth table is, let me get to the interesting part a little faster. So this is a logical end. So you can summarize it by saying, you know, the logical end of, of two proposition is true only if both proposition are true. So if proposition one and two, I do a proposition one and proposition two, that Boolean expression will be true here which is the only case where P1 and P2 are true. If one of them is false, those two cases, or both are false, then the logical end is false. What about the or? It's kind of the other way around. As soon as at least one of the two propositions is true, then the result will be true. So if I say P1 or P2 and both of them are false, well, that's going, that's going to give me a false. But every other case, if P2 is true, if P1 is true, or if both of them are true, it's going to give me true, okay? So you have those table. You should pretty much remember them very quickly. But if it is the first time, like uh, if you never heard of stuff like that, then you have them also in the appendix. And if you study the slide a little bit, that will come easily. And then this is the XOR. So the XOR is if anybody has any problem remembering one of those, that's going to be the one that you're going to forget because it's a less intuitive, okay? So if you want an intuitive way to remember what the result of P1 XOR P2 is, uh, you can remember it like this. It's kind of asking the question, are the proposition P1 and P2 different? Do they have different truth value, right? If you look at the table, when P1 and P2 are false, 
the XOR of P1 and P2 is false. But when they are both true, it's also false. So it's only when one of the proposition is going to be true, the other one is going to be false, or vice versa, that you are going to have your exclusive or become true. So in old days, that was used actually to do some graphical effect. I doubt that it's really relevant nowadays. But back in the day when we were still using Sprite and stuff like that, an XOR operation could allow you to actually display something on the screen and then restore what was behind it. OK? Well, it answers the question, is it different, right? So if you have two pixels superposed, you can know if it's the same pixel you're trying to draw or not. And this is the part that I want everybody to be on the same page with. So the individual truth table, you memorize them, or you get used to them, or you reference them. But you're going to be OK. I don't have any, pro I don't have any doubt that everybody in this class can read a truth table, even if it's the first time you hear about it today. What I want you to be careful about is when you have actually a more complex Boolean expression. For example, that Boolean expression says, so P, Q, and R are going to represent propositions, right? So things like, for example, X less than 10, or things of that nature, or other Boolean expression. So if I write not negation of the whole expression P, logical and another sub-expression Q or R, I want to know when this expression is true, when it gets false, depending on what P, Q, and R are. So what I need to do, one colon for each, and I'm going to list all the combination. So all the combination of Boolean values here, I start with true, 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 for example, or I could start with false or false, it doesn't matter. True, 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 then I change this one. True, true, false. Then true, false, true, true, false, 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 true, true, etc. Have you guys uh, studied binary encoding in any other course? No? That's a binary enumeration. If I count in binary, the first number is going to be 0, 0, 0, with three bits, right? Then it's going to be 0, 0, 1. Then the 1 jumps here, 0, 1, 0. Then I add a 1 here, 0, 1, 1. When my 1s are full here, I get a one in the next position, and I restart at zero. One, zero, zero, one, zero, one, one, zero, one, et cetera, one, 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 okay? So that's, that's the idea of enumerating all possible combination of two things that are binary, zero, ones, true, false, okay? So I do this for all of the variables. How many of those are there going to be? If I have three variables, how many possibilities? Eight, Eight. two to the power of three, okay? So it's going to be always two to the power of the number of variable. And then what I want to do, I want to break it down into death sub-expression first, Q or R. Well, that's like the truth table of the logical disjunction, right? So I can just look at the truth table. I'm going to look at Q and R and fill up this column. And then I'm going to look at P and Q and R. So I'm going to look at the column P. I'm going to look at the column Q and R that I computed here. I'm going to apply the truth table for the end operator and put the result there. And then finally, once I have this result, negation of that, whatever is here, true or false, I'm going to put the opposite here because I apply again the negation truth table. And that's it. So that is the only way, I would say, to completely understand a non-trivial condition for E statement or for while statement. So yes, the stuff that you guys are learning in discrete math has direct application for programming, okay? It's not, it's not calculus. It's this one we use actually on a daily basis. So let's take a look here. Q or R. So Q, the rule is as soon as one of them is true, the result will be true. So Q and R are true, yeah, true. Q is true, F is false, true. The other way around, true. False, false, eh, no dice. And then true, true, all of them are going to be true except that one because, again, Q and R are false. So I completed that using the truth table from the previous slide. Okay. And now that I have this intermediary result, I'm going to do that result, logical and P. So I'm just looking at this colon, this colon, and I say true and true with the logical and that gives me true. True and true, again. True and true, again. True and false, false. False and true. One of them is false. It's false. False and true, again, false and true, again, 
false and false, well, you bet. If both of them are false, the result is definitely false. And then last step, negate that. So negation of all this, right? Negation of all this formula, true becomes false, false becomes true, and that's it. So this tells me when P is, for example, true, when Q is false and R is false, then this condition for my if statement or my while loop is going to be true. So now what I have to ask myself, and this is what's going to go back to testing, what I have to ask myself is, is this what I meant? Is this exactly what I meant? So let's say that P is, for example, variable X is even, Q is variable Y is even, and R is X is lesser than Y. So now I put like some meaning to P, Q, R, I'll check if they are true and false, and I'm going to see whether I'm going to execute this part of the code or that part of the code. Okay, so sometimes, yes, you have to do truth table. Um, as long as you are just using things that are very simple, like for example, uh, just x less, x lesser than 42 as a Boolean condition, you don't need truth table. If you do x lesser than 42 and x greater than 10, you can figure it out. And then depending on you know like your brain stretchability, you can throw in maybe a few more logical operator and you're going to be okay. I would challenge everybody Anybody to take actually a Boolean formula that's completely random, right? That's like maybe an entire line long and just look at it and tell me what's going on. This is where you're going to just start. Most of you, like 99.9% like .9 of, and I put myself in that bucket as well. This is where I'm going to have to stop and think, okay? Instead of stopping and thinking by staring at the Boolean formula for like half an hour and telling myself nice little stories about what I think it's doing, well, let's put in the work, right? Do the, the, the bloody proof table. You are going to know exactly how your formula is behaving. And then you check each possibility. You make sure that the output makes sense. All right. So for how many of you, uh, for how many of you, was this totally new? Nobody? Cool. Okay. All right. So that should be easy. Awesome. All right. Next. Syntax, syntax stuff. So we're dealing with something called short circuit evaluation because it's not yet complicated enough, okay? The way that we just do a simple if statement. So you see now why I didn't want to introduce all of that stuff at the beginning, right? It's just a pedagogical choice, but I prefer students to learn how to use an if statement and write code with it, even if it's a very simplified if statement, then have to worry about all this during week number two. Right? So now we are like, now we're dealing with the stuff we have to worry about. So what happens when you have even a simple Boolean expression such as if first condition and second condition, okay? Well, we just, we just saw it. The semantics, the meaning of the if, uh, of the, sorry, the Boolean algebra tells us if that condition is true and that condition is true, then the whole expression here becomes true. Otherwise, it's false. OK, so I know everything. No, you know everything from a mathematical point of view. But now there is an implementation of things. And this is where we're going to have a little bit of fun. So what's happening here is when you run that kind of code in Java, it starts by evaluating one of the sub-expressions first. Remember what we said about precedence of operators, the priority of operators? OK, and then we talked about associativity left to right, right to left evaluation. So there are, bottom line is even if you don't remember the details, there are rules on how Java interpret an expression. And we saw that with arithmetic expression. But since I told you that arithmetic expression and Boolean expression are still expressions, so they have a lot in common, well, it's true also for Boolean expression. So what I'm telling you is this condition is going to be evaluated first, and then that one. So the Logical end operator is left to right associative, if you want to use the jargon, okay? So here's the funny thing. Well, I mean, your mileage might vary, but I find it funny. Um, if it's false, if that condition is false, and I know I'm trying to evaluate the logical end, do I really care about evaluating the second condition? I mean, that's just going to take a few milliseconds, right? But let's say that the condition, some condition can actually call methods, right? They are expression. 
So a Boolean expression can be, for example, if x is lesser than three and call the method, you know, detect if the keyboard is connected. So I have to do some work, call the method, get the return value, then working into the expression. So yeah, condition can be arbitrarily complex. So what Java is saying here is like, wait a minute, if this is false, if P1 is false, there's no way the outcome of the whole expression is going to be anything but false. So let me take a shortcut and the, net, the, the name, okay? Short circuit, shortcut, well, okay, whatever. Uh, let me try to take a shortcut here and let's not evaluate condition number two. Okay, so that's for the logical end. The logical or is going to work in a very similar fashion, okay? Is the first condition is, and this one, we're going to look at it being true. If the first condition is true, same thing. It's the opposite of the end, right? If the first condition is true, according to the truth table, the outcome of the whole expression will be always true, no matter what. So I don't care to check if P2, which is condition two here, is false or true. I'm going to skip it. So these are like the shortcuts that actually the implementation of Java and many modern language is doing. Okay, so a lot of the, I don't, I cannot think of a language that is not doing that actually, but it's just off the top of my head, right? They are all trying to skip evaluation that they don't need to do, okay? And in that case, that means there are some specific rules for the logical and and the logical or. Who cares? That's a good question. That's a legitimate question, especially when you're a student and lunchtime is approaching, right? Who cares about whether Java is evaluating left to right, right to left? It does not matter. Maybe it goes a little bit faster, but that's it. Well, yes. But you remember what we said about assignments? We said that assignments are actually both statement and expression. So the difference is that a, an expression you compute a value and then that's it, it's pure, it's mathematical, nothing happened but computing the value. A statement can do all sorts of things like changing a viable value in memory, okay? In expression, I can call methods. Methods can have side effect. I call this method, it returns to me the square root of 36, but it also print a page with the result, you know, in front of art. Okay, so this side effect, this assignment of value to variable, how do I account for them? Let's take a look at this code. I have two variables, x and y, equal to zero, okay? And then I execute that simple if statement. If x, so this is not equal equal, this is assignment, okay, watch out for that. If x assigned to 42, I parenthesis that, so that the priority is do that first. If the result of that is lesser than 40, and, I assign y the value 42, and the result of that is less than 45, then print a message on the screen, okay? So if I run this right now, is it going to display boom or not? No? I have one no already. No? I see a lot of no's, cool, awesome. All right, so if I do this, it's going to display this line right after that displays x equal x, y equal y, right? It doesn't display that. So that condition is not true. Let's take a look at what happened. After I'm done evaluating this condition, x is 42, y is still zero. So now we need to look at the detail, right? What, what the hell happened here? So first, x is assigned 42. So that's why after the if statement x is 42, okay. Half of the mystery is solved. 42 lesser than 40, false. It's an end logical operation. I give up. The first half was false. There's no way to fix it now. It's going to be, the whole thing is false. So I skip this. If I skip this, I skip assigning the value 42 to y. So watch out. As soon as one of your Boolean expression let me rephrase that differently. As long as your Boolean expression are quote unquote mathematically pure. What I mean by pure is that you evaluate them, they give you a value, that's the only thing that happens in the universe, okay? Uh, as long as you are in that category, you're okay, you're safe. Or none of that matters. As soon as you call a method in one of your Boolean expression terms, 
or you assign a value to a variable, or you use a plus plus, a minus minus, one of those operators that we talked about, that's it. You have a side effect happening. So evaluating the expression is not going to be something that you can do 50 million times and nothing changed. No, you evaluate it one time, and the values of some variable in memory has changed. Or the printer fired something, or you send a message over the network, right? So you have to be careful about those. As long as you have trivial terms in your Boolean expression, you're okay, or pure, I should say. As soon as it's not the case, potential for bug. What about the second one? So we reset x and y to zero. We use chaining of the assignment operator. And then we evaluate this expression. And this is true. And it displays booyah on the screen. And then if I display the value of x and y, I get x equal 42, y equal 42. So what happened with this one? Like same logic, right? X, so I reset x and y to zero. X is assigned 42. 42 is lesser than 40. No, false. But this is a logical or operation, right? So it's false, the first one is false, but I still need to check the second term to see if possibly I have a true. And if I do have a true, then the whole expression is true. So I evaluate the second term, y equal 42. So now 42 is also assigned to the variable y, which is why we have those two things there. Is 42 lesser than 45? Yes. So the first proposition is false. The second proposition, proposition is true. According to the Boolean table for the logical disjunction, the or operator, that means the whole result is true. Yeah. Oh, good question. Awesome. I, I was going to forget about that, actually. I think I have a, a note that I must not forget about that, but I forgot about the note that told me not to forget about it. Thank you. Um, so question is, what is this backslash n that's hanging around there in the middle of the string? So this is called an escape character. Let me open a quick parenthesis here to show you what I'm talking about. So we are going to do just a, a simple system.outprintln. OK, so system.outprintln. And the string that I'm going to display OK, better. Thank you. <laughs> so it's better if I actually click on the thing. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a simple system.outprintln. And then in the string that I'm going to try to display, I'm going to put those special characters. So there are two special characters I want you to be aware of. Backslash n, the one that you spotted, and backslash t. So let's see what they do. If I display one, two, three, four, five, backslash n, six, seven, eight, nine, backslash n, zero, one, two, three, again, okay? So remember the backslash is how we neutralize the meaning of a special character, right? But the backslash itself is a special character. Well, if you follow the backslash by a few select letters, like n and t are the two that we're going to look at, then it has a different special meaning. If I run this, the backslash n caused actually the display to go to the next line. Backslash n stands for new line. You, are, you guys are going to encounter this also in C programming, OK? C, C++, all those languages that are the C family with the curly brace syntax. Generally, they have also those escape characters, OK? Um, you are going to encounter them also in JavaScript, actually, in Python. So it's pretty, main, pretty mainstream, OK? So if you put a backslash n in your string, that means new line inserted right there. If you just want to display, you know, I just want you to display backslash n, then what do I do? Say that again? Escape it, yeah. All right. There we go. So I escape the escape symbol, compile it, run it. So because I neutralize the special meaning of, it, of a backslash, right? So now there's just a regular backslash that happens. Uh, because it was a regular backslash, the n that follows it is not interpreted as part of, you know, the sequence backslash n. What's up? Oh, you're right. I did a typo there. Uh, yeah. So what's happening here? What is happening here? I don't remember if backslash zero actually is a control character that I uh, that I forgot about, or if it's just a noctal conversion of one to three that end up on the screen. But yeah, this is not this is not what was intended to go there. So after the six, seven, eight, nine, we needed to have another backslash n, go to the next line, and then resume writing. Okay. 
So that's one of the two special characters we're going to talk about. The other one is called backslash T tabulation. What happens when you tap when you um, type tab, when you hit the tab key? You go towards the right, you know, by three or four characters, depending on your text editor. So that's exactly what backslash T does. So if I put a backslash T here, it's going to tell pretty much go to the next tabulation. So generally, I stop the explanation here, and everybody understand yet yeah, that just puts the space, which is not completely wrong, right? But it's a little bit more than that. So let me try to show you an example. So I'm going to display one, two, three, four, five, and then I'm going to display one, tabulation two, go to the next line, and then I'm going to display one, two, tabulation three. That example generally is enough to, to spell out the difference between a tabulation is just putting a few space and actually something different. What's happening here? I have one, two, three, four, five, go to the next line. Then I have one. This is a tabulation. It's worth two spaces. You can tell, right? Two spaces. And then on the next line, I have one, two, and I have a tabulation. But this time, the tabulation, the backslash T, is worth only one space. So how do I figure out how many spaces the, tab the bloody tabulation is worth? Well, the way that you have to visualize it is you have actually in your terminal every four character or so you have a tabulation. So your terminal would have one character, two character, three character. This is a tabulation. One, two, three, tabulation. One, two, three, tabulation. One, two, three, tabulation. This doesn't appear anywhere. It's just built in. This is how the display of the screen is organized. So when you display things, if you display, for example, one tabulation two, it's going to say, I want to push the two to the next tabulation. If you try to display one, two, tabulation three, then it's going to replace the tabulation by how, how many number of space you need to push a three align with the next tabulation. That's what the tabulation is. Anybody ever use the typewriter in this class? Thank you for making me feel that old. Okay, well, that's where it comes from. Okay, can it type terminals back in the 60s with Unix system? Typewriters, you know, you hit the tab key, that's what it does. It jumps to the next marked tabulation of the terminal. Okay, so that explains a little bit what those characters are about. And sometimes we use that. Okay, the so backslash T, uh, backslash N, I introduce only those two because these are the ones that we end up using once, twice, three times over the semester in assignment. So I want you to be aware of them. Okay, so thank you so much for bringing that question. All right. Going back here, what's next? Uh, just a quick remark about why do we care about this stuff? Uh, well, we care about it in the context of programming language, that's for sure, OK? But let's say that we are using a Unix system. So I'm going to fire up here uh, the Windows subsystem for Linux real quick. I should be able to boot, OK? So I'm on a Linux command line right now. So I'm going to make a folder. So first, let's see what I have. I have a lot of junk in my personal folder, but I think I have a, there we go, COP2512 folder. OK, so I am in a folder here. The folder is empty. LS is least the content of the folder. So I'm going to create a directory. I'm going to call it Foldy. Foldy is a folder. So now, yes, I have a folder Foldy. And uh, then I'm going to create a file. I'm going to use an inline text editor called Nano, and I'm going to call it, uh, for example, file.txt, file1.txt, all right? Hello world, and then exit that stuff. All right, so if I, take, if I display the content of file1, I have a message in it. It's just a text file, okay? So now what I want to show you is how the logical AND operator and the logical OR operator, because of their short circuiting properties, are also used fairly commonly in scripting. Like when you are doing bash scripting on Linux or on Mac OS, I think the shell is ZSH now, or like even the Windows command line, okay? We use those things fairly, uh, on a fairly regular basis because they allow us to do things like this. For example, I can say, um, I want to go into my subfolder, 
And then inside the subfolder, after I enter the subfolder, I want to create an empty file named uh, Mark. Okay, that's the syntax to do that in Linux. Doesn't matter the syntax. I'm not here to teach you Linux. Okay, but pretty much first command from this position in the file system enters the subfolder, semicolon next statement, then create an empty file named Mark. Well, here's what's going to happen with this. What's going to happen is that it's going to tell me CD. Subfolder, I don't know. There's no subfolder anywhere. And yeah, I don't have a folder named subfolder anywhere here. So it failed that first command. But what I wanted to do is I wanted to create an empty file named mark inside that folder. But my first command failed. So it went to the second command and created a mark empty file right here in this folder. So that can be problematic. Sometimes you don't want to chain a bunch of action. And you don't want the, the script to keep going through all the action if one of them early on failed. So guess what? We are going to use what we just learned to make that a little better. So let me remove the file mark so it's not there anymore. And now I'm going to rewrite that thing here. But instead of just using a semicolon, that means next command, next statement, right? I'm going to use logical end. So this time, if I do this, it's treating it as a Boolean expression, but a Boolean expression that has a shitload of side effects because the first sub expression here is changing the directory that I'm currently in to go inside a subfolder. Well, that one failed. Every, every single instruction that you run on a command line terminal is going to return a code to the terminal. And the code at the very minimum, it tells you one thing. The command succeeded or the command failed. It can't tell you more. It can't tell you exactly what happened, but that's the minimum, right? So every command that you execute in a script can be considered as a Boolean value. It evaluates into a Boolean value, which means you can put it in Boolean expression, which means in this case, this Boolean expression gets evaluated left to right. I try first to go into the subfolder. If the subfolder doesn't exist, that command returns false. And because this is a Boolean expression with a logical end and the bash scripting language, so, so I use the ESH, so is the Windows command line, they all use the short, short circuit evaluation. I'm not going to bother evaluating the second part. So I'm only going to execute this if that command was successful. Okay. How many of you already hate command line? Maybe because of this example or from before time a little bit? A lot. Okay, maybe. Okay. Hear me out. <laughs> you, are, you know what I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you. No, you need to love command line. Come on. But let me just show you, more importantly, why I think you guys need to get used to command line and why it can actually make you more powerful at your job. Okay. What we did here, we just bridged together programming and executing stuff on a machine. So from now on, Anything that you can do on a machine that can be done, you know, with a, a script command or command line or whatever, which is pretty much everything, right? Everything that you can do on a machine, you can actually write a little program that's going to do several instructions, several uh, operations, one after the other. But you can also now throw in everything that you learned about programming. So you can execute conditionally things, you can execute things in a loop, so you can automate the boring stuff. And it's actually the title of a nice little introduction to Python book, how to automate the boring stuff. And that's actually the essence of, you know, even IT. We don't want to have to do things by hand. We want to have to, we want to be able to do them uh, as automatically as possible, relying on the computer, right? That's our job. So what about the logical or? So I have here a typo, but now I have LS. So I have a file one. I'm going to make a subfolder. There we go. I'm going to go inside that subfolder. If I can uh, spell. All right. And now that I'm inside the subfolder, I want to say I want to copy the file one.txt inside the subfolder. Okay. But let's say that I don't know the name of that file. It could be file one, it could be file two, it could be file three. I don't know which file I'm going to find. Okay. Well, I can say I want to copy file let's start with file two so that it works actually i want to copy file two right here but if that fails that's the logical or symbol 
then I want to copy file one right here. And I could keep going. And if that fails, I'm going to look for file three or something like that, right? So if I run that right now, it tells me I cannot find file two dot txt. Yeah, I didn't create, there was only a file one dot txt, right? But then it went ahead and tried the second part of the command and found actually file one, okay? So this is just a quick illustration here. You're not going to have that on the test. Don't worry, it's not on the PQ, GQ, and stuff like that. But it's just to start you thinking, and other classes are going to do that more in depth, okay? But this was just to start you thinking about uh, pretty much the connection between system administration and programming, for example, uh, or even you know like scripting in a in a visual development environment and programming stuff like that. Okay, so that's just like the the first of many connections that you guys are going to encounter, and you have everything in the slide if you need it. Okay, so next and last thing for this session, we're going to talk a little bit about refactoring conditional statement and Boolean expression. So most of you apparently have already gone through this topic in um, discrete math, so that should be easy, okay? I'm going to approach this only from the programming perspective. So let me show you what I mean. So we, you remember in module one, two, three, when we talked about refactoring, I kind of make it sound like it's a joke. It's not a joke, but given what we knew back in module one, two, three, if you tell me, can you rewrite that for loop, that while loop, sorry, differently? The answer most of the time is no. Can you rewrite that if else statement differently? No, I only know one syntax. But now we're starting to learn more syntax as well as starting to learn tricks. So refactoring is when we are going to try to rewrite our code, exploiting those over alternate notations that are available in the Java language. So let's take an example here. If is even equal equal true, I can I simplify that. Yeah. So I would remove what? What part? Okay, cool. Yeah. Because we saw that is even is a Boolean variable, right? We had an example like that a few slides ago. Is even is a Boolean variable. So it's going to contain true or false. When I test is even equal equal true, that expression is going to be true when is even contains true, and it's going to go to be false when is even contains false. Okay? So all I have to do really is look inside is even, and I will see if it's true or false that is inside of there. Okay? So yes, now we can start, and it doesn't matter which one you write at the final exam, okay? But I'm just telling you that as you go to the next class and then the next after, you are going to start thinking more and more about that kind of stuff. You are going to try to look at your code and see, okay, is it overly complicated? Once you get used to programming, the, side, the right side is actually much more readable. Okay, it doesn't make you wonder, you know, what's going on. Same thing for easy value called false. What would I replace that by? Yeah, we have the negation operator, right? The exclamation mark. So let's use it and let's use the same trick that we had here. So now we can simplify this and say if not is even. Is even contain true? The thing here is false. Is even contains false? The thing here is true. That's exactly the same thing. So refactoring, what I told you when I introduced refactoring is refactoring is completely neutral. It doesn't change actually what the code is doing. It's just changing the way you write the code. So now you can see that the more you learn about a programming language, the more experience you become, the more uh, kind of uh, possibilities you have for refactoring. And then let's look at this one here. So Boolean is even. If x modulo two is zero, is even is a sign the value true. Else is even is a sign the value false. How would you simplify this? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, first point, absolutely. I can get rid of those curly braces. They are completely unnecessary there. Good catch. Anything else? So we can shoot those curly braces. What bothers me is having like an if else, if I can just get away with just having an if, okay, like a half if. So what about this? 
Boolean is even by default, I set it to false. I have to initialize my variables anyway. And then I say, if X modulo two is zero, then I change my mind, is even is true. And I can shut down the else part. Makes the code simpler, okay? And then next part. So I can definitely remove those curly brace too. I didn't illustrate that on the slide, but next step is, wait a minute. So if is even contain true, sorry, if this condition is true, X modulo two equals zero. If this condition is true, I put true in is even. If this condition is false, I put false in is even. So whatever this condition is, true or false, that's what I put in the variable is even. So screw that, I don't even need a if else. What I'm going to write is is even, Boolean is even is a sign. It's a Boolean variable. It can be assigned the result of a Boolean expression. Here's my Boolean expression. X modulo two equal equal zero. And that will put a true or a false in the variable depending on whether the expression is true or false. What about this one? So this one, I'm going to give it to you. We're going to finish quick. Um, this one is just about refactoring based on operator precedence. Okay. So it's not true for every programming language, but Java and a lot of you know curly brace family programming language, they are going to actually have a higher priority for the comparison operators and almost actually everything, okay, except uh, the assignment, I think, compared to the logical. Boolean operator, which means that those parentheses here, I can remove them. And then it's still going to do first x lesser than 10, true, false, x greater than 3, true, false, and then combine them with the n logical operator. Okay, I don't have to worry about this. Um, again, don't play with fire if you are afraid of getting burned. When you write code in an exam, you don't have to get rid of the parentheses. I'm not going to remove any points if you have too many parentheses. Play it safe, but then I'm telling you, this is a whole story. Eventually you'll get there, okay? And you have like a few classes to go to get there. And this is just a table that you use. Okay, we are going to wrap it up here. The next example are a little bit more involved. Uh, so thank you for your attention again. And if you have questions, I'm not running away anywhere. You can ask me.